Welcome inside episode 602 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains in the summer of Dorian continues as they take care of one of their own. Josh Norris re-upping on an eight-year term. And Pierre Dorian wasn't done there, Ross, as the first prospect from the 2022 NHL draft has also been signed to the Ottawa Senators. We'll get into all that. Plus, Kyle Dubas continues his love for the Sens, signing another cast-off. This is the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day. Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Senators your first listen on this Friday. July 15th, we are free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube, where we just hit 3,000 subscribers. Thank you to everyone. We really do appreciate it. The best way to continue helping the show grow is to like the video by clicking the thumbs up. Continue to tell your friends to subscribe and leave a comment below. As I mentioned, Josh Norris signing an eight-year contract with a total value of $63.6 million. That works out to be an annual average of 7.95 Pilsy. The more things change, the more they stay the same. They get it just a shade under $8 million. Yeah, you'll love to see that. And I mean, that was number one on our checklist for Pierre Dorian, right? Is get the Norris deal done. And we kind of hummed and hawed. Oh, is it going to be a long term? Are they going to bridge him? They went full. (laughs) Like it doesn't get much longer and bigger than this because they went with an absolute massive splash getting Josh Norris locked up for the next eight years. He's going to be 31 years old when this contract expires, Ross. Yes, he's in line to have a second big payday as long as things go well. We'll get into what that contract means in many different levels. But Josh Norris with the same agent as Brady Kachuk with Newport Sports, he said at the exit meetings he wanted to get something done quick. And you have to think Brady was in his ear as well, just saying like, It takes a while to get up and running when you miss training camp. So they left absolutely no doubt getting this done on the second day of free agency. Now, they could have extended them any time during the past season, but I believe both sides wanted to shelf it during the season. What's your overall thought? Yeah, what's your overall thoughts on, on the annual average value? Because we've seen some think that it's an overpayment. Others are laughing at that notion saying, hey, we're, we're taking care of our own. Like this is the new age senators. So who cares if it's a little bit of an overpayment. Now he can grow into it. And others are like, dude, this guy was on pace for 45 goals, a 22 year old first line center. What do you mean he's overpaid? Where do you stay on that uh, entire arc? I think there's arguments to be made on both sides. I would not go out there and say, this is a team friendly deal. I'll start with that. Definitely not a discount or anything like that. Just under 8 million for a guy coming off his entry level deal is a big deal. Especially when you look at the fact that Kachuk and Shabbat, were the guys that got eight million or more after their entry level. So that's the kind of standard where that's being held. But I think, and and I said this in the update, is anytime you have a player that has a shot like Josh Norris, I won't fault you for investing in that. And keep in mind, he missed 16 games and he still finished third in league-wide power play goals. Only Kreider and Dreisaitl had more uh, goals and they played full seasons on the power play I'm talking about. So... For him to be so successful already, he fits in perfectly alongside Brady Kachuk, your captain, another player locked down. It was a no-brainer for the Ottawa Senators to get this done in an eight-year term. And if you had to pay a little more, like, I think, Ross, I probably would have been comfortable right around $7.5 million. I think that's probably where the sweet spot is. But if you have to shovel in an extra five hundred k to keep him happy and to lock him down for eight years, I got no issue with that. No, me neither. Now, uh, I'm just going to play devil's advocate. Do you think that his power play prowess becomes a little less important now that you have Alex to bring it on the other side? Or is it just a situation where you can never have too many weapons? Definitely less important because last year, Josh Norris was the power play. Like that, <laughs> that was it. It was yeah. how can we get the puck to Norris in his office for his one timer? And if that doesn't work, not let's try something else. Let's try it again. 
<laughs> like that's <laughs> that's what the power play was, and it was successful. So now you have a situation where it doesn't need to be option A, and you, it's doom or gloom if you don't get that done. Now you've got to bring it, and you can spread the wealth, like we talked about when Ian Mendes was on. The fact that this team is now going to have the opportunity to have enough firepower to properly deploy two power play units. Team second penalty kill units can't just be gr- like uh, grinding scrubs on the fourth line, just getting a couple of shifts. Like they're going to have to actually shut down this second unit. And I'm sure Norris and Debrinket will both be on the first power play unit. But what I'm saying is now we don't have to look at it as if Norris doesn't score on the power play, just let the let the two minutes run out. Like there's more right. options here. Like the last thirty seconds of a power play last season, you're like, okay. Like you may it's as well just waste just ice the box. Yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah, let's just keep Even this moving along for everyone. Kyle Dubas is collecting the Sens PP2 members. We'll get into that a little bit later with Gaudet and now Victor Mete going uh, across enemy lines in the Battle of Ontario. But you mentioned this past year, third in power play goals. Well, I'm going to take it back for both full seasons that he's played in the National Hockey League. 22 power play goals in 122 games. That's good for 11th in the National Hockey League. Now, again, he missed all those games. The leaders, Leon Dreisaitl, who played 14 more games than Josh Norris. Guess who's one in front of Josh Norris in power play goals the last two seasons? I, I looked at this, so I, I might have an unfair answer. Is it Ovi? No. No, Ovi's Ovi a little is, higher. Ovi's three ahead. Just tap it in for me. Just tap it in. Just tap it in. Oh, Matthews. No, come on. He's a little bit higher. He's one goal ahead of Ovechkin. Line A? It's Alex Dabrinkit. Come on. Oh, I, I put nice. that on a T for you. Come on. Uh, nice. No, but that, there's there's never enough weapons here on the power play. And we'll get in, I'm sure, later in the summer of like the embarrassment of riches. Like who goes where? Who goes to the second unit? Most importantly, I know I've seen some people thinking, are we just going to go five forwards on unit one? Come on. No, I don't you love can't that. do shabby yeah. dirty like that. I know he's, some people think he's maybe not the most ideal, but what does he do? is he facilitates at the top of the umbrella. And now he's got two guys on either side that are ready with cannons to unload. So Niner, we know he's not a disher. He'll tell you that himself. But one thing that I love uh, from his game is that he can hold his own in the defensive end too. And as this contract matures, we'll pull up on Cap Friendly for those watching on YouTube in a little bit, the breakdown of this contract. But there's so much room for him to grow into it as a whole. And also... It's funny to say this, but at 21 and 22 years old, he may have already faced the toughest competition that he's going to because as the secondary scoring becomes more prevalent for the Senators going forward, teams aren't going to be able to key on that Norris, Kachuk, Batherson line the way they have the last couple of years. So I see this as almost an advantage. And how about the way he snaps them back? Over 50% of the faceoff circle is a young centerman. I just see this as a situation where those who are saying it's a bit of an overpayment, I look at the potential for growth. And those that say his shooting percentage is unsustainable, I'd probably say 20% is unsustainable. And that's what he shot last year, which was top five in the National Hockey League, if I'm not mistaken, for those who have uh, a certain amount. But 20.3 last year. But then you go back, and in his rookie season, he shot 17.7. As a rookie in Belleville, he shot 19.4. And as a sophomore at Michigan... He shot 14.5. And if we're doing this alternately as goalie friendly show, what's an average save percentage? 915? Yeah, 910, no, 915. Let's say 910. Like let's say yeah. 910, because this will make it easy. That means that means uh what, oh what boy, is we're under doing 10. math here. <laughs> that means that the average shooting percentage is under 10. Because that would be an easy break because over 90 save percentage. Way to go. We got there. Math guys here on locked on centers. But I'm just saying you're looking at a guy who year after year, shoots above average. He's an absolute sniper. I love what sends prospects, or sorry, sends chirp. We're going to have sends prospects on soon though. But sends chirp said, he goes, on one hand, will he shoot 20%? And on the other hand, have you seen a shot? I love, yeah. love that analogy. I mean, that's just the analogy. thing. Like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he hovers right around 15%, which is good, sustainable shooting percentage. Yes, Correct. 20% is high. I think if you can stay around 15%, that's solid. And he's probably going to get less shots now that Dabrinkit is around as well because that guy's a shooter. So I think it's we're going to see some big changes this year and he may take time to adjust. But for the people that are out there mad saying this is an overpayment, 
the Ottawa Senators have spent years being like, we can't overpay guys. We can't even pay guys. Like, we have to ship them out because we can't even dream of trying to match the contracts they need. So if now we're at a point where maybe we're overpaying guys, we're in a good spot. That's what winning teams struggle with, is they have such good players that they need to sign for long-term deals at good at big contracts, and then they have to work around it. Josh Norris is one of those guys I want to work around. If yeah. Get him locked in, and we'll figure out the rest as we go. Because not only does he play well with Brady Kachuk, but it's... Did and, you know their best friends? Yes, I did. But And that's what I'm getting at, Ross, is... I think people undervalue how important the culture is. And Josh Norris is a big part of this culture. Huge. And to have him be able to grow and keep on developing this really good, strong culture that the Sens have, he needs to be here for a long time. And that's worth investing in. So I, I got no issues with the contract. I love it. Pierre Dorian, stay hot. And when <laughs> when you talk about the culture, I mean, he's got to pay for that nine chain. Like, what what a guy. He's got the chain with his number on it. Love how the Sens put that out um, on the post where they threw a couple highlights together. We're, we're going to have a highlight reel coming here one of these days of Josh Norris just absolutely lighting up tendies. And another yeah. fun moment uh, with this contract is you can look at the most comparable deals on cap friendly and i know they're completely different players and we are trolling a little bit with this one but it certainly sparked an emotion yesterday when i tweeted out at send central that josh norris got paid more than nick suzuki because he's a better player than nick suzuki but it's the most matched contract the most comparable contract 97 percent match between nick suzuki and josh norris so that'll be some fun banter for sends and habs fans over the next few years whichever way the contract may fall now, with that, there are still some pieces of business to get done for Pierre Dorian. We said yesterday we were going to get into a defenseman debate. Who would be the best fit as a top four D-man coming up here on Locked On Senders? And we also have another signing, as you mentioned in the intro. And will it come hand in hand with another player for you to watch? A Sens prospect at the August World Juniors? All that coming up. But first, Pelzi, you got a word from one of our favorite sponsors. And Ross, as the Ottawa Senators signed, extended rather, Josh Norris, I thought to myself, I better check out the odds for this team for the Cup. And I know I'm not saying they're going to win the Cup, but hey, if the odds are nice, I'm going to toss a couple shekels on it. And that's what I did. I went to betonline.net, where the game starts, and I got a look at what the Ottawa Senators under Stanley Cup odds are, and you can too. Go to betonline.net. They are the trusted online sportsbook of the Locked On Podcast Network. And sure, hockey's over, basketball's over, but baseball's in full swing. There's golf, there's boxing, there's UFC. There's so much going on, and betonline.net is your number one spot for all your sports betting needs. It's the best spot for sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Guys, it's betonline.net, where the game starts. All right, Pilsy, this is the Locked On Senators podcast. We appreciate everyone making us your first listen each and every day. Next week, Monday through Friday, and then afterwards we'll get into some summer scheduling just for a few weeks, but not until Pierre Dorian finishes what he started here on this run of unparalleled success. And a news piece every day, we do have to mention as well, Antoine Bebo and Jacob Larson signed on two-way contracts and I actually like the bet on Jacob Larson seems like a top pair AHL type player a 2015 first round pick mm -hmm. who hasn't really made it at the National Hockey League level we asked our friend JD Hernandez over at Locked On Ducks what his thoughts were on Jacob Larson and he was more so saying like maybe he gets minutes as a top six guy but all in all you expect him more as a guy who plays down in Belleville. This is exactly what J.D. Hernandez says. He never got quite panned out in the NHL level, but was great with the goals last season. Mostly a stay-at-home defender, got a little bit of power play time, contributed there, a fringe guy, maybe a number six defenseman in Ottawa. Meanwhile, Pilsy, I'll let you hit on both these. Bebo, we spoke about it uh, last week. This was a smart signing because injuries happen. You don't know what you're going to need. And this way, if there is an injury at the NHL level and you just need a guy to come sit on the bench, 
We won't have to go through a Gustafson situation like last year where you're messing with a guy's development and Sogi can actually get his games in at the AHL level. Yeah, exactly. And I'll touch on Jacob Larson first. This is a great signing, like you mentioned, first round pick, but it's not like he's like some fresh kid. He has 150 NHL games, like three seasons of wow. playing over 40 games in the NHL. So, and mind you, that's on a rebuilding Ducks team, but still to be able to, to have that uh, in your resume is, is pretty good. So he's someone, I kind of feel like he's like a Dylan Hetherington type, you sure. know, like he's someone you can trust on a, in a top role in the AHL. And if you got to bring him up for a handful of games in the NHL, you don't love it, but you feel okay about it on a, on a third pair role there. Oh, over under 15 NHL games next year for Jacob Larson. I mean, that's tough because it depends entirely on injuries. Um, right. And I'll right now under. the Sens have eight defensemen. Exactly. On the for that roster. reason, I'll go under uh, because uh, he's going to have to leapfrog a bunch of people. But yeah, I like the Jacob uh, Larson signing a lot. And now on to Antoine Bibo. Um, I mentioned this to you earlier, Ross, and I like this signing because I don't really like this goalie. And that's not a slight <laughs> at him personally, but... Better than McNiven, though. Much better than <laughs> McNiven. Again, not a slight, a personal slight, just looking at stats here. But the reason I like him because I don't like him is because it, Bebo's stats aren't very impressive wherever you take a look at him. But that means he's expendable and the Sens won't feel a need to get him in a certain spot. He's just an extra goalie, which is all the Ottawa Senators need. And it, who knows? Maybe he comes in and he's a good personality and I and I change my mind and yeah. uh, I do end up liking him. But this is the type of guy we were looking for here because I think if it was a more veteran guy, like the Mike McKenna situation we kind of talked about, then those guys are looking to get in games. Like they're they're trying to right. squeeze every last bit out of their career and they get a little frustrated if they're if they're hanging around. Whereas Bebo, he's probably he's probably just stoked to to have an opportunity here and to continue to collect a good paycheck. So I think both those signings make a lot of sense and continues to be a great offseason here. And he's actually played more games in the East Coast League last year than he did in the AHL level. He actually backed up Joey Decord a little bit in Charlotte yeah. in the AHL, but also in the ECHL, he had a 923. So shout out Atlanta Gladiators fans. You <laughs> might get a good one here in Antoine Bevo, but just more organizational depth. And as a goalie-friendly show, even I think we are pushing the limits on how long we can talk about Antoine Bebo. He's a dude. He's a dude. And uh, welcome yeah. to the organization to both of those guys. Hoping to welcome a uh, top defenseman. Still to the organization, Pierre Lebrun had his last rumblings before he takes off to the cottage for the summer. And he said that he thinks that Mackenzie Weger is going to stay in Florida, especially now that Ben Chirot signed elsewhere up in Detroit with uh, Ben Chirot. But I don't think that's going to stop the Sens from continuing to push for Weger. I think he's probably their top guy thinking they could maybe re-sign him as a, as a Nepean guy, you know, bring in that local flavor that we know that they love and, not the Eric O'Dell local flavor. Now we're <laughs> on to the Claude Giroux of the world. But with Uyghur, I mean, he would be my number one choice. I got a lot of traction just tweeting out saying, make it happen, Pierre Dorian. But Pilsy, you're on the other side of the ledger here. I think you're more of a John Marino guy. And uh, before we get into this debate, I want to preface something. Oh, we're, we're going to talk about Bebo again? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the, there's a big difference between me saying... I see a better fit with Marino and me seeing saying, I think Marino is a better player. I do not think Marino is a better player than Mackenzie Weger, but for that, for that reason, I think Marino is a better fit because the issue with Mackenzie Weger is this is like, he's an incredible defenseman that puts up big points and Florida knows his value. I think everybody knows his value. I think maybe at the start of uh, last season, he was kind of an underrated guy, but I don't think that's the case anymore because he puts up big points and he's someone that after this very team friendly deal of, I think it's just over $3 million after this, he's going to get paid and Probably he's going to want to easily double for sure. Double. What is he? 28 years old. I think he might he might even be a little bit less uh, than Kinda that. Brown so. pick though, eh? Shout out to Weegsy for getting it done. Oh, Twenty eight oh yeah. years he, old. He's put the work in and two hundred and six overall, Pilsy. Wow! And how many points? If I'm not mistaken, he had forty four assists last year, right? Forty four points. Thirty six. Oh, forty four points. Okay, yeah. so plus I plus forty like four somewhere. This is what hey, I'm saying. This this is an 40. incredible defenseman. Like he's probably going to be looking for around seven mil in his next deal, especially at, at that age. This is his time to get paid 
So yeah. for that reason, bring that money, bring that money to the auto economy, just like Goody. Let's go. Yeah, but I think he's <laughs> going to be bringing that money to the auto economy, courtesy of the Florida Panthers, not courtesy the of the Ottawa yeah, Senators. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> that's that's the thing. Like, I love Mackenzie Weger. I want to be up there in the clouds with you, Ross, but I don't think it's the right fit because we're at a point where the Ottawa Senators, we actually do need to be concerned about the cap. Before, it was just like, oh, uh, the Sens, they're not the going to spend to the cap. What's the budget? Exactly. So we can't talk about the cap. But now we're we're past what we thought the budget was, and we need to worry about the cap. So for that reason, I'm out on Uyghur, especially to acquire him would cost a lot. So that's why I'm turning over to John Marino, because John Marino... Not only, what are you laughing at here? For for that reason, I'm out. I feel like I just turned tuned into Dragon's Den. <laughs> yeah, I'm out. I'm out. Um, but that's why I'm looking at John Marino because he's younger. He's 25. Mm-hmm. He's already locked up to a really good contract. Uh, I lost my page here, but I think 4. it's five years at 4.4. Four. Exactly. No signing bonuses in there. And, and he's someone that put up. Mackenzie Weger light points like last year he had I think it was 26 assists one goal 26 assists like he hovers between 25 and 30 points consistently in his three years in the NHL and he's already locked up he's someone that I think could really play an, a nice complimentary game to Thomas Shabbat and he's someone that I, I think could fit into this culture. He's at that age. And I know you're probably thinking, well, Brady Kachuk beat the wheels off of him. But <laughs> look, Brady Kachuk is a bigger, stronger guy than him. And I respect Marino for it was at the end of a game. The Penguins were up 6-4 and Brady Kachuk takes a pretty good run at him in the corner. And I respect Marino for being like, hey, I know who you are. I know you're stronger than me. I've watched. I've checked the game notes. I've watched your hockey fights. I know you don't lose fights but I'm pissed off. I, I won't let you have that. And if it means <laughs> letting you punch me in the face five times and I go down, I don't care. I'm going to stand up for myself. And I, and I respect that. And he's a Harvard guy. He's a, he's a smart guy from Boston. And he's someone that I just really see would fit into this situation nicely. And the Pittsburgh Penguins, they need to shed some cap space here because They've got Kasperi capping him still as an RFA. Now, mind you, he's not going to break the bank, but they're probably looking to re-sign him at some some kind of level here. So I would be going for John Marino for the purposes. He's a right-shot defenseman, younger, already locked up, and I think you could acquire him at less of a price and less risk than Mackenzie Weger. Fair. And he actually played uh, the most he's played with over the last three seasons is Marcus Pedersen. So that's kind of a situation where Pedersen would be the guy who's more stay at home and allow Marino to roam around a little bit. Uh, funny enough, his third most common line mate over the last three years in uh, Pittsburgh is Matt Murray. Like, <laughs> <laughs> nice. But obviously goalies get to get a, a bit of a move up there. But I think all in all, yeah, I wouldn't be upset with either of these guys. So now if we pivot to a Calvin DeHaan, if we're going to go that direction, I might kind of raise my eyebrow a little bit and wonder what the end game is uh, for, for the decor. But either of these guys I think would be fantastic options. Of course, you get more cost controllable time with John Marino. Yeah. But I don't think Mackenzie Weger would just be here for one year. I think that, and right now, being past July 13th, they could make it a sign and trade where he does extend, and that would obviously make it a lot better. Right now, the Senators, you're right. They uh, they got to start looking at the cap a little bit, which seems uh, almost wild to say. Right like now, if they brought in Uyghur, they're, they're very close here, whereas if they bring in Marino, just swap him and Zaitsev's cap hits. Right, yeah, 100%. Now, Zaitsev is, is the X factor here in his $4.5 million cap hit, 11.64 right now is what the Ottawa Senators have um, in cap space with Alex Formented, Mattia Joseph, and Eric Brandstrom yeah. left to sign as restricted free agents. So there is uh, still a bit of wiggle room. It's not like they're right up against it like we do know a lot of teams are. But you do have to put in the back of your head now, um, not only for this year, but beyond. And it's a problem for another day. But if you look, the way that the contracts are structured – between Brady Kachuk, Josh Norris, Thomas Shabbat. In 2024-25, they're going to be paying Shabbat $10 million, Kachuk $10.5, and Norris $9.5. Okay, that's a lot of money for three players. That's a lot of I don't know. I don't know who's cutting those checks, but again, the cap hit 
is certainly reasonable when you look at what the Senators are building here with Brady Kachuk at the top with 8.2 and everyone else kind of falling into place underneath that. The last enormous one that they have to get done here. I guess there's two now because you got to bring it in the mix. But Tim Stutzla coming up after this upcoming season. No Arbrights, however, Alex Dabrinkit does have arbitration. He's a guy I would not expect to see extend this offseason. Or let's see how he fits in with the team, get him accustomed to the, the culture and all that, and then hopefully uh, wow him enough that he's willing to re-up because that is just a... I, I think that even through all the excitement, the Claude Giroux, the Norris extension, getting Alex Dabrinkit for me is still like, the biggest win this off season for Pierre Dorian. Would you I agree, agree with that? Yeah. yeah. Like a 40 goal score in his prime time. in te- team control. And it, no it, prospects given up. Yeah. It like, it's like, um, I think it was McPhee when he acquired stone and they asked him about it. He's like, guys, yeah. anytime a player like this comes up and you have a chance to get him, you got, you got to do it. Like it's, yeah. you, you have to do it. So, yeah, with, I would say to bring it, it has been the biggest win. Also because of the message it sent. The message, because Claude Drew said it. The moves Pierre Dorian made this week made things a lot easier to get this done. 100%. Well said, Pilsy. All right, we do have a signing to get to as Dev Camp wrapped up. Shout out Team Green for taking home the three-on-three tournament championship trophy and... Who won the Jonathan Petra yes. Award, which is the most prestigious honor you can have as a member of the Ottawa Senators and their development camp. Plus, one member of the development camp signed his entry-level contract right after. We'll tell you all that right after a quick break right here on Locked On Senators. All right, welcome back to Locked On Senators. I'm Ross Levitan alongside Brandon Piller and Sense Dev Camp has wrapped up. I don't know how Pierre Dorian, if Pierre Dorian kept his eye on Dev Camp with all the other yeah. moves that are going on, but it was a successful week. It sounded like Tyler Boucher really established himself as a force in this camp, but he didn't get the Jonathan Peach Award. However, another member of the organization who Dorian was raving about on TSN 1050 last night, everyone should go listen to that interview is with Mark Rowe, great guy by the way, Mark Rowe, Dave Poulin, and Frank Corrado, which was kind of a cool yeah. uh, aspect because Corrado obviously played under Troy Mann a little bit in Belleville a couple of years ago. So that was kind of a cool dynamic to have him in on that conversation. But Dorian was so relaxed talking about how Tyler Boucher, he's just like, be patient with him and it'll be all good. But he also said Ridley Gregg was a star in the making and he got rewarded with the Jonathan Peach Award. So stick taps to a friend of the show. In Ridley Gregg, we absolutely love to see that. Is he going to force himself into the mix here in training camp, Pilsy? I don't think so. So Sorry to burst oh, that just balloon curious. you just spent uh, blowing up there, but this team's too good now. Like, take oh. out the Brinkett and take out Drew, and we're having a different discussion here. There's roster spots open, but we took a um, early uh, line projectulation uh, yesterday, and the only spot we even had an asterisk on, and that was, well, of the forwards I'm talking about, was yeah. Mark Kaslick. And honestly, that was more just for discussion. I kind of have Mark Kaslick almost in pen as the fourth line center because it just works so well. So there's not a lot of wiggle room for these prospects to make their way up. But if anyone could do it, it would be Ridley Gregg. Like right now, he's he's the shining jewel prospect of the Ottawa Senators. And he's the type of player that, Coaches will see his drive and see how he works and how he plays and value that a lot. I don't think he's quite ready to make that jump. I think uh, a season in Belleville would do him a lot of good learning how to play that aggressive style still, but transitioning it to a pro level up against men. I think that would do him a lot of good. But yes, big congrats to Ridley Gregg for winning uh, the Jonathan Petro Award because I feel like he's a guy that really puts the work in and he got credit for it there. He certainly did, and uh, sends prospects putting out that he was the most relaxed player on the ice, which was awesome as well. You know, you just see a situation where he knows how good he is, right? Oh, like yeah. he, he, oh, knows. he knows. And yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> that's Go listen to our interview if you if you are concerned about his uh, confidence because yeah. he lets it shine. I love the how how when we let him go, he's like, "Thanks for chatting me up, boys." <laughs> yeah, yeah, love that. Or, um, I, I think my favorite answer from him though is when he did that stick lift and launched that guy's stick like it Connor went, McLennan 
it went like 20 feet in the air. Like it, it was launched. Like that was like a javelin throw. And yeah. he's like, yeah, just a little stick lift there. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Former winners of the Jonathan oh, Petra yeah. award um, include Eric Griba in 2010, Mark Borowiecki in 2011 and 2012. Back to back. Freddie Clayson in 2013, yeah. Curtis Lazar in 2014, Max McCormick in 2015, Nick Paul, who does it all, in mm-hmm. 2016, Andreas Englin, who's built like a like a weightlifter at the Olympics. But... I feel like the Englin one, and I shouldn't say this because I don't know, but I feel like that was just like a little, like we'll toss him a cookie to try to get him going here. Because that was a second round pick that just... And it was also three really years going. after he, he got drafted. Like, it, he was like it really seemed like that was like a, hey, good work, keep, keep grinding kind of uh, award there. But hey, nonetheless, well earned. We got another two-time champ, Parker Kelly, the shift disturber, although he had to share it with a young Brady Kachuk. <laughs> Look at Brady in that photo here. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and, of course, a really inspiring story. Tina Bolview, Bolview yes. um, there, the, the mother of Jonathan Petra. If you don't know that story, I know it's a few years old now, but mm-hmm. you, you really have to go and, and search that up because it is as inspirational as you will ever see um, the fact I remember the Sens went to go see him when he was in hospital in Minnesota, when they made the trip there and, uh, just, uh, an absolute joyful kid under the worst circumstances, something you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. So great to see that his legacy lives on. And it's so appropriate that it's for the hardest worker because Jonathan Peacher really had to battle every yeah. day of his life and, uh, did it with a smile as well. Like some of those photos with Brian Murray are just so precious now, especially looking back in time, getting goosebumps, just uh, thinking about that. But another member of the Ottawa Senators impressed enough to get a contract, Tomas Hamara. The the pick that you mentioned was your favorite. A lot of draft analysts really kind of focused in on an undersized puck moving defenseman in the third round. The Senators got gets his entry level deal. Now he signed an extension already in Finland for to pair. So he's going to be going back there. I know some sense fans were pretty excited because Kitchener owns the rights to him in yeah. the OHL, but I believe he will be going back to Liga, but stick taps for the entry level contract. And also Czech Republic or sorry, sorry, sorry should I say Chechia as they like to be called now, they just released their summer um, tryout list for the world juniors and he's on it. So we could have, we know Ridley Gregg's going to be there. We know Levy Merrill line and we know that Roby Jarventi yep. are all going to be there outside chance. Tyler Boucher makes it for team USA. But now we got another guy, Team Chechia, Tomas Samara. So stick taps there. Your thoughts on him being officially added to the organization. I love it. Yeah, as you mentioned, I thought that was their best value pick and the best prospect as of now uh, to come out of that draft. And I think it makes a lot of sense to to get that done when he's going back to Liga. I think you just want to be like, all right, we like what we saw from you. Continue to develop it in Finland in Liga, but we have plans for you. You know, that's kind of what that says is we see you in our, our plans and we want to start developing you and uh, keep working so you can work your way back over to North America. Yeah. And this same strategy worked with Lassie Thompson, again, a first round pick. So a little bit different circumstances, but in a sense, you're giving them a a little carrot too, because they get the signing bonus. Hey, here's $90,000. You know what? Feel good. You're part of the organization and go work hard and, and make it, make it important for you to be a big part of our future going forward. Now I kind of glanced over this with Levy Marilainen, but interesting and nothing's been confirmed yet. So maybe this is just ahead, but we know that elite prospects, they have bots that are all over the place for contracts, transactions and everything. And it's showing that he's playing for Carpat next year. So he might not be back in the OHL. Should we speculate on that or should we wait until something's official? I mean, we can speculate that on that. I'm not totally surprised, Ross, because a big reason why he came over here was to join that stacked Kingston front and next team, right? Correct. And now you start looking at that team without Shane Wright, and it, it's not as enticing. And he's he's now gotten a taste of North American ice. And this is a guy that he played his best hockey when he was over in Finland and when he was playing internationally. So I don't have an issue at all if he does end up going back to Liga. And I think, um, I forget, you could probably remind me, who were the goalies ahead of him that were kind of blocking him? Uh, Joel the, Blomqvist was one of them. And I and, and there's one more that I can't uh, put my finger on. Was it Callie Klang? It might have been. Eh, maybe I feel like that was more of a uh, 
a world junior, the guy who was in there with okay. him. Let me pull it up here. It was oh Eustus Ananen, who uh, who played in uh, who played in Colorado um, as their third string goalie. Uh, Joel Blomqvist actually only played two games. Patrick Rybar, uh, a veteran Slovak, actually got the majority of starts there. But now he's moved on to the KHL. Interesting decision. Um, So he's out of the picture. So when when you look forward, and if I'm clicking just on Levy Marilainen's, um, because they show where he's expected to play next year. If I click on Carpath's roster, it seems like it will be Joel Blomqvist, Levy Marilainen, and Nicholas Coco. Great name. Uh, he was a second round pick 58th overall this draft by the Seattle Kraken. So he would be the youngest of the three. So maybe he's a guy who still stays in the U 20 league uh, where he played. He, he basically took Marilina's job this past season with Marilina moving to the OHL. So interesting, but we'll get into that a lot more a little later on. Let's end the show with a quick laugh at Kyle Dubas. I mean, this guy's just stacking up former Ottawa Senators. First, it was Cody Cece. Then he took a little bit of a break. Then he goes out and gets Logan Shaw, the Belleville Sens captain. You're like, okay. Shout out Logan Shaw, by the way, who's played in Cape Breton, Quebec City, Montreal, Ottawa, Belleville, Winnipeg, and now Toronto. This guy yeah, is doing wow. a cross-Canada mission right there. Um, but they get him, sure. Then they get Adam Gaudet. All right. And now... They signed Victor Mete. Good on Mete, though. Have a week. He's getting married this weekend. And great tweet resurfaced from 2013. These <laughs> are honestly so bad. That's awesome. And I remember that tweet because we brought it up on the send sign. And we are like, yep, this guy, this he gets dude. it. He fits in. And uh, Ross, speaking of the, the Canadian tour, I think you can expect Mete to be in your neck of the woods next season as he continues just to move one city over to the West True. slowly, slowly, and slowly. So yep. uh, look out for Victor Mete, Winnipeg Jet in 2023. But yeah, it's like before it, it was kind of funny and now it became a pattern. Yeah, kind of sad. And now it's like... Oh, I didn't even say Matt Murray. Yeah, was... Matt Murray. That's Well kind of forgettable but congrats how about, on your new number one how goal. about uh we didn't even talk about how kyle dubas was like yeah we didn't really have the option to go higher than 25 percent on the retained salary he said take it or leave it and we took it it's like okay you just got bullied by pierre dorian i mean it is the summer in dorian so can't blame him yeah and that's massive i i can't believe dorian was able to to stick on that not do 50 percent and not give up a quality prospect or even, even a quality pick like yeah it's uh or sorry i forgot they did give a seventh rounder uh that third, was a third, the, a third. The, and, and it's the seventh rounder don't forget that um but now it's like kyle dubas do you know there's other players from other organizations available like you don't just need to sign former ottawa guys so that is funny but yeah victor mete as a toronto maple leaf very interesting. Let's see if they can rebuild him too. And we're going to end with a quick correction. It is Stephen Halliday, the Senators. Okay, that's what I thought. Pick. Yeah, Stephen Halliday, and that's confirmed through DM. Stephen letting us know that it's spelled Stephen. Pronounced nice, Stephen. Stephen. We got to get him on the show. I got to ask him about that tournament. Remember, I told you that uh, yep. he, he was absolutely dominant there. I was like, hey, why is this guy head and shoulders above everyone and bigger than everyone else too? Uh, little do we know at that point he was a NODAC commit, uh, but now oh, heading whoa. now heading to the Ohio State University. All right, lots to get into next week, Pilsy. We got a special guest joining us, maybe a couple, and then we'll get into um, to a lot more in terms of the larger picture of what this cap situation is going to be with the Ottawa Senators. So we got all that to get to. Pilsy, any final thoughts before we go? I can't believe that everything is lining up in succession like this. Like for, for now, Norris to be done – there's no massive things that need to be done now. Sure, we're still looking for that top four defenseman, but I, I wouldn't say that's something that needs to be done immediately. And they can kind of play around with that. And even if they don't end up acquiring a top four guy, it's not the best situation, but we, we can work with that. So this has just been an incredible week by Pierre Dorian. Uh, I'll continue to give him praise because it, it just seems like it gets better and better. So Josh Norris locked up for eight years. Love it. Absolutely. And I'm sure we'll have something new to talk about Honestly, on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> but if something happens before then, make sure you're subscribed to the Locked On Senators YouTube channel because there will be always an immediate reaction to any move for the Ottawa Senators. We want it to go like this. Sends make news. Your mind goes to 
Let's hear what the Locked On fellas have to say about this. Let's get that fired up. Be a, te- be a friend. Tell a friend. We appreciate everyone for making us your first listen each and every day. The vibes continue to Woo. remain at an all-time high. I feel like we're at a music festival where you wake up, you're like a little groggy, a little hungover, and you're like, nope, we got more, we yeah, got more good times ahead. So let's <laughs> yep. keep that rolling. Rap Blues through. Fest, essentially, here. Let's yes. keep going. <laughs> Shout out Luke Bryan last night. We saw a lot of people on social yep. media enjoying him. So let's keep those vibes rolling. For Brandon Piller, I'm Ross Levitan. This has been the Locked On Senators Podcast, your team every day.